perhaps now's the time um, to start properly. So I'll do that now. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And it's um, an absolute pleasure to welcome you to this, um, our latest webinar, uh, alumni webinar. My name's Janet O'Sullivan. I'm the Vice Master at Selwyn. And um, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Jenny Moore, um, who's going to deliver this afternoon's webinar. So Jenny was a student at Selwyn in the 1990s. In fact, she arrived at Selwyn in the same year as I did. So it's a very, very auspicious year. And she's the author, um, her website says, of Funny Books for Children. Um, she was the first UK winner of the Commonwealth Short Story Competition. And she's been shortlisted for the Greenhouse Funny Prize, which sounds wonderful. Um, and the book she's going to read from today is Agent Starling Operation Baked Beans. And um, it's wonderful when you look this book up on Amazon. Um, I shouldn't mention Amazon. I should talk about independent booksellers. But anyway, look, when you look it up on Amazon, it gets five star reviews across the board. And I've just written down a few of the things that reviewers have said about it. So the first one said, this book was a delight to read, living, breathing history at its best wound up in a genius and original loo papered plot and all the joys of a secret agent expedition. And another one said, such a hilarious story with brilliant characters. It had me laughing the whole way through. I'm looking forward to Jenny Moore's next book. So no pressure there, but um, absolutely um, rave reviews. So um, before I hand over to Jenny, I just want to um, say that we've got, a, we've got the chat function here on the webinar and we really hope that as many of you as possible can think up questions to ask Jenny and post them on the chat and then um, when Jenny's finished her, her reading we'll have a question and answer session so it'd be really great if as many of you as possible could submit questions. Um, so with that reminder I'll now say um, it's time to hand over to Jenny. Thank you so much. Hi right well thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to be reading chapter one today and um, find out how it all began and then I thought we could time travel over chapter two and get to some Roman Britain action in chapter three. So without further ado, this is Agent Starling, Operation Baked Bees, chapter one. Oliver Starling was in the bath washing jelly and custard out of his hair when the greatest adventure of his life came calling. It had been a pretty normal sort of morning until then, apart from the unfortunate incident with a runaway hamster and a flying bowl of trifle. In fact, it had been a pretty normal sort of life until then. Like most 11 year old boys, Oliver had never eaten a honey coated dormouse or fought in an amphitheatre. He'd never been chased through the streets by angry Roman guards and he'd never even heard of Dr. Midnight, the world's number one evil genius. But all that, was about to change. Oliver, called his mum from the hallway. He couldn't decide if she sounded excited or cross or just plain squeaky. Perhaps she'd spotted the custard splatters on her new curtains. Oliver, she called again as she came charging up the stairs. Come on, out you get, quick as you can. Her voice grew squeakier with every step. By the time she reached the bathroom door, she sounded like a cat with a trodden on tail. Get out, get out, get out! Oliver dunked his head under the water for custard busting luck, then climbed out of the bath, wondering what all the fuss was about. Perhaps the queen was on television again. Mrs. Starling was potty about the royal family, totally and utterly bonkers. Not only did she stand and salute during the national anthem, she curtsied every time she saw a first-class stamp. What's going on, he asked, shivering in his towel, as Mrs. Starling came tearing into the bathroom. She thrust the pile of clothes in his arms, his best clothes by the looks of it, and began combing his wet hair with her fingers. And what's happened to my school uniform? None of this was making any sense. Oh, Oliver, his mum squealed fishing a stray blob of jelly out of his fringe. There's someone important here to see you. Someone really important. Her face was flushed with excitement, her bottom lip trembling like an overexcited slug. He said he's here on the Queen's business, she added, attacking Oliver's chin with her royal wedding handkerchief and an extra large helping of mum's fit. So I asked him to wait in the lounge while I came to fetch you. 
and I asked him to go away and let me eat my breakfast in peace, muttered Oliver's dad, appearing in the doorway behind her. But no one ever listens to me. Mrs. Starling span round with a face like thunder. What are you doing up here? she shrieked at her husband. You're supposed to be keeping him entertained. Hmm. Entertaining wasn't one of Mr. Starling's strong points, unfortunately. Oliver must have heard his joke about the one-legged duck with a welly on his head about ten million times by now, and it never got any funnier. As for his idea of interesting conversation, well, he seemed to think people wanted to hear about his infected toenail, and that was on a good day. On a bad day, he'd probably get it out to show them. I can't be expected to entertain on an empty stomach, Mr. Growling, Starling grumbled, scratching at his toe through a hole in his sock. I haven't even finished my morning coffee yet. Why are you still here, is this way? Go and make him a cup of tea or something. Mr. Starling stomped off to look after their mystery guest, muttering something about weirdos in funny coats and fake beards. Right, said Mrs. Starling giving Oliver's mouth one last rub with a slobbery hanky. Into your clothes as quick as you can, and mind your please and thank yous. And remember, don't say what, say pardon. She glanced down at her own nightie and dressing gown. <gasps> Goodness gracious, I'd better get changed as well. Whatever will the Queen think when she hears I was still in my night clothes? Oh, the shame of it all. And with that, she went herring off to her bedroom to slip into something more royally correct. Oliver threw on his clothes and headed downstairs, closely followed by Mrs. Starling, now dressed in her favourite Buckingham Palace sweatshirt and a tiara. She had a string of Union Jack bunting wrapped round her neck like a scarf and hand-knitted corgi slippers on her feet. Hurry up now, she said, pushing him through the lounge door. You mustn't keep him waiting. Aww. There you are, Oliver, said Mr. Starling, pulling his sock back on over his infected toenail. If anyone wants me, I'll be in the kitchen, finishing my cold coffee. He hurried off, leaving Oliver alone with their strange visitor. He was dressed in an ankle-length raincoat, with dark glasses perched on top of a long pointed nose, and a curly grey beard that kept slipping down his chin. In fact, it looked a little bit like this. Take a seat, said the man. You're probably wondering why I'm here. Yes, agreed Oliver, popping a bubble of bath water in his left ear. That was one of the things he was wondering, along with, who are you? Is this all a dream? And why are you wearing that ridiculous beard? It looked like something out of the drama dressing up box at school, like a bedraggled pirate crossed with a goat. Please, thank you, he added for good measure, remembering his mum's instructions. The name's Owl, said the man, handing Oliver a royal blue business card with Agent Owl on Her Majesty's S service printed in bright white ink. The S stands for secret, he whispered, tapping his nose and winking. But keep that to yourself, eh? You never know who might be listening. He checked the curtains and cupboards for lurking eavesdroppers, muttering under his breath as he peered underneath the sofa and chairs. He can't be too careful. His spies are everywhere. Whose pies? asked Oliver, popping a bubble of bath water in his right ear to cover his confusion. What sort of person hid pastry treats under the furniture? No, hissed Owl, not pies, spies. They work for Dr. Midnight, the world's number one evil genius. Chances are they're watching us even as we speak. He crossed back to the window and peered out. There he said, pointing to number 47, where someone was peeping through the net curtains. What did I tell you? No, that's just old Mrs. Pika, said Oliver. She's a bit on the nosy side, and her cat wheeze on everyone's shoes, but I'm sure she's not a spy. Ha! Don't be so sure. Dr. Midnight's got plenty of old ladies working for him, you know. They're cheap labour, and no one ever suspects them. 
Plus, they're good at knitting jackets. His pet poodle, Josephine. Owl shuddered. <laughs> You'll have to watch out for Josephine. She's got very sharp teeth. What, Oliver? I mean, pardon? Woolly jackets, repeated Owl, and sharp teeth. But we haven't got time to worry about that now. We're looking for someone to undertake a top secret mission, Oliver Starling, and our sources tell us you'd be perfect. Me? Precisely. We heard you got a merit award for your school project on Roman Britain last term, and your great, 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 more greats than we've got time for, great grandfather, was none other than Titus Stabacus, the great centurion. Really? Oliver straightened up in his seat. Agent B will fill you in on the details of the mission once we get to S Service headquarters. All I need to know now is whether you're ready for the greatest adventure of your life. Oliver thought for a moment. Hmm, greatest adventure ever or another day at school? It was a tough one. But what about breakfast? And what about mum and dad? They might not want me battling evil geniuses, especially not on a weekday. Don't you worry about that, said Owl, readjusting his beard. I'll have a word with them now. He fished around in the pockets of his raincoat and pulled out a large bar of chocolate. This should keep you going for a bit. Oliver got to work on the chocolate, while Agent Owl got to work on his parents. I don't think so, he heard his mum say. He's far too young for that sort of thing. Besides, I don't want him missing out on his education. But he wouldn't have to, Owl told her. We'll be back before you know it. It's not every day someone in our family gets to do something exciting, Mr. Starling said. I haven't done anything exciting in 26 years. Do be quiet, dear. And of course, the Queen will be able to thank you in person at the next royal party, Owl added. All our agents and their families are invited. Mrs. Starling gasped. <gasps> the Queen? she squeaked. Person, did you say? Oh, well, I suppose someone needs to save the world from evil geniuses. After all, it's not every day a starling gets to do something this exciting. That's what I said, grumbled Mr. Starling. But no one was listening. Right, have a quick break there while I transform back from secret agent to a children's author. I can see better without my dark glasses on now. <laughs> There we go, that's better. Um, as I said, we're going to leap straight over chapter two today. So I'm going to give you a quick lowdown on what we'll be missing. Uh, chapter two sees Oliver and Al head to S Service headquarters, where Oliver meets Agent B and learns more about the mission. He learns that Dr. Midnight has already travelled back to Roman Britain in a portal loop time machine. And he's staying at the villa of his great, 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 more greats than we've got time for, great grandfather, Lutius Maximus. And we're going to be meeting him in a bit. Um, he learns that Dr. Midnight is already busy changing history, using nappy pins to help keep people's togas on, and baked beans. Because who doesn't love baked beans? Well, apart from me. Shh, don't tell anyone. Um, and Olive also learns that their time machine is a photo booth. Um, like the ones you get in stations and post offices where you can get your passport photos taken. But he's about to learn the most important news of all, and unfortunately for him, it involves pink frills. So let's pick the story back up at chapter three and find out more. Chapter three. It wasn't until he was changing into his tunic, a special spy tunic with secret pockets for hiding things in, that Oliver spotted the terrible underwear muddler. Mrs. Starling must have grabbed the wrong clothes out of the washing basket in all the royal excitement. Uh-oh. She hadn't given him his pants at all, which explained why they kept falling down. But they weren't his dad's pants either. Double uh-oh. This wasn't just a muddle up, Oliver realised, staring in horror at the changing room mirror. This was a full-on underwear crisis. A disaster. Mum's pink frilly knickers had never looked frillier. And to make matters worse, they were her special royal ones, 
with glittery crowns and flowers and a picture of the queen's head on each buttock. How is he supposed to save the world in these? Come on, called Owl through the changing room door. They're ready for us now. The time machine's up and running. Oliver slipped his feet into his Roman sandals, hoping for the best. So long as he kept his tunic pulled down nice and low over his knees and his frilly knickers pulled up nice and high, no one need ever know. You'd better have these, Agent B handed out a mini guide to Roman Britain, which Oliver tucked into one of his secret pockets, and a purse of Roman coins for Agent Owl. Poor old Owl was squinting in the light without his beloved sunglasses on, with funny white rings around his eyes where they usually sat. The best of luck to both of you, added Agent B. Just remember, the history of entire, our entire country, maybe even the world, depends on you. No pressure then, thought Oliver, as they squeezed into the booth. Ready? asked Al. Oliver took a deep breath. <gasps> Ready. Off we go then. Say cheese. Glutinous Maximus yawned, clutching his large, gurgling belly. He'd been up late the night before with Dr Midnight, feasting on stuffed dormice and those funny little bean things from the metal container. The beans were delicious, but deadly. He'd been trumping in his poga all morning. <laughs> Gluteus let rip with another shocker and belched loudly for good measure. But master, the slave crept into the room, trying not to breathe in the poisonous fumes. Yes, what is it? Gluteus snapped. The guards have found a strange object in the villa gardens with two intruders inside. What sort of strange object? Gluteus's belly gurgled louder than ever as he hauled himself onto his feet. I suppose I'd better go and see. He followed the slave out into the summer sunshine and waddled over to investigate. A beak-nosed man with owlish rings around his eyes stood squinting in the light, while his companion, a nervous-looking boy in a tunic, cowered behind him. Dr Midnight's black-cloaked guards already had the pair surrounded, but Gluteus was more interested in their mysterious box. A big white box with a curtained doorway and a beautiful lady's face across the front. It must be Venus, he decided, the goddess of beauty and love. But what was she doing in his garden? What is this thing? Gluteus asked, yanking back the curtain and peering inside. Anyone home? It's the photo booth, said Owl, struggling to free himself from the muscly arms of his captor. A special sort of machine for taking your photograph. <laughs> snorted Gluteus. I'd like to see it try. No one steals my photograph and gets away with it. Guards, seize this thieving boost machine at once. He broke off for another quick burp. What in Jupiter's name is a photograph anyway? Sort of like a wall painting of your face, Owl explained, but much smaller and easier to carry around. The booth doesn't steal photographs though, it prints them. Not that printing's been invented yet. Um, I tell you what, why don't you try it for yourself? He fished out a Roman coin from his purse. All you have to do is sit down on the little stool, put the coin in the slot, and smile at the white screen. This had better not be a trick, said Gluteus, eyeing him suspiciously. He turned to the biggest and burliest of the guards. Make sure the prisoners don't try to escape, he ordered. I've never seen such an unsavoury looking pair. And with that, he snatched up Owl's coin, climbed into the booth and pulled the curtain shut behind him. I'm sorry they caught us, Oliver, whispered Owl. It was so bright without my sunglasses on, I couldn't see a thing. But don't worry, all less service agents are highly skilled in the art of escape. I'll think of something. There was a flash of white light from inside the photo machine, followed by a terrible roar. I am blind, Gluteus screamed. Holy mercury, my eyes. There was another flash. Ah, there it goes again. Help me, you blundering fools! The guards all rushed at once, pushing each other out of the way in their effort to reach them. 
Oliver and Owl seized their chance and slipped away, slinking across the garden towards the villa. It looked just like the paper mache model Oliver had made for school project, only with straighter columns and less hamster droppings mixed in with the white wall paint. Now what? Oliver wondered as he crouched behind a sculpted marble goddess, his brain still reeling from the most amazing morning of his life. So much had happened since he climbed out of the bathtub, it was hard to take it all in. Had he really just travelled back to Roman Britain in a photo booth? Were those real life Roman guards, with real life sharp pointy swords, he just escaped from in a pair of falling down frilly pants? And was now a good time to pull them back up while no one was watching? Oliver adjusted his underwear, peeping out from his statue hiding place to see Gluteus lying on the ground, clutching his eyes and shouting. Don't just stand there, you brainless idiots! Gluteus screamed at the unfortunate guards. Go and find them! Psst! Owl, have you thought of a plan yet? Oliver asked, secretly hoping for a plan that didn't include angry Roman guards with sharp pointy swords. Owl scratched his chin. Hmm. Let's wait until the photos appear, he said, and then make a dash for the villa toilet while Gluteus is distracted. The toilet? Is that where we'll find Dr. Midnight's quarterloo? Hmm. I hadn't thought of that, Owl admitted. To tell you the truth, I'm just rather desperate for the loo. Romans do have toilets, don't they? Oliver nodded. We learnt all about them at school. But they don't have toilet paper, just the wet sponge on a stick. Owl pulled a face. The exact same face Oliver's dad had pulled when Mrs. Peaker's cat weed on his new work shoes. But before he could answer, there was another loud cry from the photo booth. It's me! Gluteus shouted, waving around a set of passport photos. Look! Four little pictures of me! Look at that perfect bone structure, that fine Roman nose! What a handsome beast! He was too busy admiring himself to notice Oliver and Owl creeping into the villa. Fast as you can now, hissed Owl, as they slipped through the main entrance into the cool shade of the house. It was even more impressive on the inside, but there was no time to stop and admire it as they darted across the central courtyard dashing through room after room of beautiful mosaic floors without so much as a second glance. Agent Owl was a man on a mission, an urgent sponge on a stick kind of mission. Thank goodness, he gasped as he barreled into the lavatory holding his stomach. It's just like in the programme we watched at school, said Oliver, recognising the funny stone seats and the narrow channel cut into the floor to carry away the waste. Well, Almost. What he didn't recognise as being Roman was the blue portaloo sitting slap bang in the middle of the room. Owl had ignored the Roman loos and was already rattling at the door handle. Come on, come on, he begged. I'm not sure I can hold on much longer. Time travel does funny things to my tummy. I'm in here, came a deep voice. You'll just have to wait. Owl's eyes bulged. <gasps> He looked nervous all of a sudden, unless that was his separate for the toilet face. Grrr. The deep voice was followed by a funny growling noise. Owl looked properly scared now, unless that was his I really can't hold on any longer face. And then, finally, came a flushing sound. The portaloo door swung open and a yappy little poodle in a pink knitted jacket came charging out towards the waiting agents. Ow! shrieked Oliver, as two sharp rows of teeth clamped tight around the back of his ankle. Down, Josephine, called a short, bald-headed man, stepping out of the portaloo, clutching his own personal toilet bowl. His toga was edged with a broad black stripe and fastened with a large nappy pin. No biting our guests, please. The dog released her grip on Oliver's foot with a hungry howl of disappointment. Thank goodness. He could feel spots of blood trickling down into his sandal. At least, not until we've introduced ourselves properly, said the man, locking the door behind him with a big key hanging on a chain around his neck. Dr. Midnight, gasped Owl, just as I thought. His 
face was positively green now. Agent Owl, replied the bald man with an evil smile. We meet again. I didn't realize my great, 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 more great than we've got time for great grandfather Gluteus had invited you. Still, he continued, the smile turning to a snarl. It just so happens that I've converted one of the spare rooms for extra visitors who drop in unexpectedly. I like to call it the Chamber of Pain. Perhaps you and your young friend would like to see it now. I know you're going to love it. No, no, no thanks, stammered Oliver, who was 99% certain he wouldn't love the Chamber of Pain, unless it turned out to be short for the Chamber of Paint Rolling. We're in a b b bit of a hurry, actually. Owl didn't look keen to try it out either. He was already backing away with his legs crossed, his face looking greener than ever. On the count of three, start running, he whispered at the corner of his mouth. Got it? Got it, Oliver whispered back. Dr Midnight clicked his fingers and a pair of burly guards appeared out of nowhere. Yes, your evilness. Seize them, shouted Dr Midnight. Gruff, barked Josephine the Poodle. Run, shouted Owl. Forget about counting to three, just run. Oliver ran, or at least he tried to. Time travel seemed to have done something funny to his legs. They felt like they belonged to someone else. His falling down pants weren't exactly helping either. Of course, they really did belong to someone else. You get the big one, he heard Dr Midnight telling the guards. And Josephine? You get the boy. The yappy little dog set off in hot pursuit. Hurry, Oliver! Owl screamed behind him. Faster! Come on, Oliver told himself. You can do this. It's just like sports day, only with a silly dress on and a crazy dog trying to bite off your foot. Yes, that was better. He was really running now, running as if his life depended on it, which it probably did. Josephine the Poodle had a taste for Oliver's blood, and now she wanted more. Dun, dun, dun. There we go. Now, thank you very much for listening to that. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really enjoyable. I'm giggling in my own study. Um, we've had loads of questions, um, both in advance and sent in today, and we've also had some comments. So I just have to read out um, that Anton, age nearly six, just wanted to say hello and thank you for the story. Oh, thank you. Um, My <laughs> um, and then um, Sarah and Ariana have said, uh, awesome story, Jenny. We love it. And then they've got two questions. The first one is, if you hadn't become an author, what else would you like to have become? Oh, well, um, when I was younger, I wanted to be a woodwind teacher. I did a lot of music and I played the clarinet, the flute and the oboe. So that seemed like a logical choice. But um, writing, writing won the day. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and also from Sarah and Ariana, they said, what gave you the ideas for this particular story? Oh, it's hard to remember, actually. I had the idea a very long time ago when my daughter was tiny and she's 20 now. <laughs> um, it's been a long time brewing. Um, so I think it's probably an amalgamation of lots of things that I've been thinking about at the time. And just, I love the idea of the nappy pins and the baked beans, I had to fit them in somewhere. And baked beans are always funny. I don't know why, <laughs> but they always make me laugh. <laughs> they are, that's quite true. Um, so uh, a question now all the way from Maryland in the USA from the Wooden family who ask, um, and this might be a difficult one to answer because they ask, which character in this book is most like you? Oh, well, I can't really say uh, Dr. Midnight. <laughs> um, I think probably it's most of me in Oliver. I've, I hoped you'd say that, definitely. Um, and who was your favourite writer when you were a child? Oh, again, hard to say because... Um, in fact, still, as an adult, it's often the last book I've just read that I enjoyed. I think, oh, they're my absolute favourite. Um, I remember I really liked The Wind in the Willows. That feels maybe a little bit old fashioned now. But um, when my children were younger, my favourite books to read with them were the Mystic Gum books by Andy Stanton. 
That's oh, yeah. so much fun to read aloud. So they're probably still my favourite as an adult as well. <laughs> Absolutely the same with me for reading to my children, the Biscuit Billionaire, and um, who was, I think, the headmaster of the school, wasn't he? They're, they're, yeah. That your, your story reminds me a lot of that sort of crazy, surreal, very funny style. And also Roald Dahl. I mean, there's obviously some Roald Dahl inspiration in there. But, yes, I did like Roald Dahl. That's yeah, he was favourite too. Um, and someone um, who submitted a question in advance asked, do you think your stories would work well as films? would be lovely to find out. <laughs> um, I think so. I think that because they, the first two months of space adventure books, I think well as a film. Yes, if anyone wants to make one, <laughs> that'd be great. Any film producers out there looking for a, a blockbuster? I think this is a, a, a dead cert. Um, so Zach asks, do you think of the plot first or the characters first? Um, it varies actually. Sometimes, sometimes a book or a story is just an incident will pop into your mind, and that's what sets it off. And sometimes it's it's a character you want to write about, and it you can't tell in advance what's going to be the thing that sparks sparks you off writing. Um, Can you remember the the very first inspiration for Agent Starling? I think it was start. I think it was the character. I think I wanted to write about a schoolboy secret agent. Yes, right. Strange to think that actually I, there aren't any are there, I mean it really is a first, I can't think of any children well, about schoolboy secret agents. So. You get some um, you get some older ones like um, Alex Ryder. Oh yes, yeah. I don't know as many who are quite so silly, <laughs> or just a silly schoolboy agent. <laughs> and, um, another silly question um, from Hannah, was the dad with the infected toenail inspired by anyone in particular? Oh, that would be giving it away, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, no, not really. It's again, it's something that I just find funny. Um, <laughs> feet and infected toenails. And it, then my next book, um, Order You on the Robot Rage, the dad's got a fungal foot infection in that. It's obviously just something that tickles my funny bone. <laughs> It either grosses you out or it makes you laugh, one of the two. <laughs> made me laugh out loud and for all sorts of reasons in my family. But uh, so, um, yes. So the other question um, that was submitted in advance is how long does it take you to write a book like Agent Starling? Um, right. Well, as I say, Agent Starling was a slightly strange case in point because it sort of grew in bits and pieces over a, a long time. But now I would say probably about three or four months. Okay. To get a good, a good first draft, and I'd probably I wouldn't I wouldn't need to change too much to it after that first draft. Although it would, would need editing process, obviously. And and another question's come in from Ned, age nine. What was your yes. first book? And I'm not sure whether Ned. I think he probably means the first book you wrote. Well, and I've written some under a different name um, as part of a series, which I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I'm not allowed to admit to those. So the first one under under my name was Agent Starling, Operation Big Bean. So you heard you heard the first one today. <laughs> first chapter of the very first book. Yeah. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, and um, can I ask you? You almost answered it. I th well, I mean, I, all the way through, I wanted to know what Doctor Midnight looks like, and you said he was bald. But can you tell us anything else about? Does he wear um, an evil cape or anything like that, or? Um, can, have you got a mental picture of him? Well, actually, uh, there's a picture on the back of the book. I don't know if you'll, if I hold it up, if you'll be able to see. Oh, yeah. That's him in his Roman gear. So yeah. he sort of fancies himself as a bit of a Roman emperor there. He's um, so, up like that. <laughs> and once, once someone's drawn the illustrations, you can't picture them any other way. Of course. <laughs> and it will be the same when it's made into a film, that's for sure. <laughs> your, your next book, um, was that a sequel? Does that involve the same characters or? No, it's an it's another standalone one. Um, it's about a girl who hires a robot double so that she can go on holiday in term time on a um, Norwegian cruise that her mum has won. But unfortunately, the robot double doesn't want to stay at home and go to school. She turns a bit evil and uh, takes matters into her own hands. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant, I love it. And is that already published or is it still? It is, yes, okay. no, that's published. And that one actually comes with a, another funny hat as well. That one, the, 
Oh. That comes with um, a pink knitted Viking hat. <laughs> hat, of course. <laughs> I want to ask you whether you made your own beard. I did, yes. I'm not a very good knitter at all, so I French knitted it. <laughs> it well, it's genius. I mean, it's... Um... I, I couldn't begin to top that from, from a beard making point of view. So, um, well, I think that's probably all the questions that we've had. Um, but uh, if anyone has any last minute questions, um, please feel free to send them in now. While I'm thanking Jenny um, so, so much on behalf of everybody here and on behalf of myself, I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed the last uh, 40 minutes. It's been really great. And um, thank you. And I think. Uh, we were talking yesterday about the fact that um, uh, if, if, if our dreams come true and coronavirus has gone away by the summer, and I'm sure that will be the case, then at Selwyn we're planning to have a big family party also to celebrate the um, opening of our new building. So um, we're, we're going to try and persuade Jenny anyway to um, do some more readings for us because this has been so yeah. wonderful. And, and incredibly well received. So thank you so much, Jenny. That's been absolutely brilliant. And thank you everybody for attending. Um, we do hope as well to do more Zoom webinars aimed at the children and grandchildren of alumni, not just um, the alumni themselves. So watch this space. The very last um, thing for me to say is that you should have received a, an emailed um, invitation to the alumni carol service Zoom which takes place next Saturday, the 19th at six o'clock. So um, please do click the link to register yourself a place for that. It will be um, um, absolutely beautiful, I can assure you. So thank you very much, everybody. And I wish you a very, very happy Christmas. Take thank care. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jenny. Thank, thank you. Bye.